We were just had a, a restless nature. We had no peace because we didn't have you in our life. Hmm. Lord, this morning, I want to thank you because you've also given our life a purpose. We have a reason to live, a reason to get out of bed every day. And so much of our life, Lord, was just, man, it was useless. We, we wasted so many years until you pulled us out of the dirt. Thank you this morning, Jesus. Thank you so much for grace. Thank you so much for salvation. Lord, so much of our life without you, it was just lost, empty, purposelessness. But Lord, we have found in you the only thing that truly satisfies. We have found in you hope. We've found peace. Lord, we have found purpose. We've found grace and salvation. And this Sunday, Lord, as we celebrate, we celebrate your resurrection. I pray that many more would see and hear and come to know that hope and that peace, that purpose, that salvation that's available in you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to do another thing that has never yet been done before in one love. Oh, we're having a whole day of firsts. We are going to do uh, reading the scriptures together. All right. You guys ready for this? Now, I had you guys hand out Bibles. I'm using the New American Standard Bible. So if you have the NASB, uh, read with me loud and clear. If you got one King Jimmy or one New King James or NIV, just jump in there. But what I'm going to do, we're going to read the, our scripture for today together. I'm going to read the odd verses. You guys with me together, we're all going to read the even verses. You got it? You guys can do that? Everybody, please stand while we read God's word. And as you stand, open your Bibles to the book of Matthew. If you're wondering why I'm having you stand, it's actually biblical in the book of Ezra. When Ezra the priest read from the word of God, the people stood in honor and recognition that God's word was being read. So Matthew chapter 28 if you have a Bible, read with me, please. If you don't have a Bible, look at your neighbor and say, Hey, Christian, share your Bible, huh? Where's the love? Everybody got it. Matthew chapter 28, first book in the New Testament. 28 after 27. I know. It's deep. All right. Again, I'm going to read the first verse. You guys are going to read the second verse with me. Verse 1 says this. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord had descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Verse 3. And his appearance was like lightning, and his garment as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel, angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Just as he said, Come, see the place where he was lying. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee. And there they shall see me. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Oh, what a difference Friday was between Saturday. That Friday we call today Good Friday, although I 
you know, in hindsight, it's easy to see it as a Good Friday, but they didn't see it as a Good Friday. They saw it as a day of darkness, a day of death, a day of despair. They had followed their Lord for three years and all their hopes he was going to become the king. He was crucified. It was a day of darkness, a day of disappointment. But oh, what a difference three days makes, huh? On Sunday, he rose from the grave. And that Sunday was a day of light. Oh, a day of love, a day of laughter, a day of liberation. Because he had risen. He is alive. And they began to celebrate. And this morning, church family and friends, I am here to tell you a hundred percent, I believe in the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And I hope today you come to know and believe in Him as well. But maybe you say, well, Pastor Mike, how do you really know that Jesus is risen? How's your proof? Well, aside from the proof that He has changed my life, and I'm sure there's over a hundred people in this room that say, yeah, Me too, brother. He's changed my life too. I once was blind. Now I see I was lost. Now I am found. But I can also tell you logically, hey, think about it. Where's the body? Every other religion, Buddhism, Islam, Confucian, that's not even a religion, but the philosophy, every other philosopher, guru, guy who came on the scene and said, I have the answers and began to teach people. You can go to all their tombs, all their graves, and see their bones. Muhammad is buried in Saudi Arabia. Buddha is actually divided apart. And you can go to different places around India. And, you know, there's elbows over here and kneecap over there. And, but his body is still here. The body of Jesus Christ is risen. The tomb is what, guys? It is empty. Man, I love it. And the deal is, some would say, well, maybe the Romans. Yeah, the Romans... They wanted to add insult to injury. The Pharisees, maybe, they wanted to rub some salt in that womb. So they took the body of Jesus and stashed it away to just kind of, you know, stick it to him one last last little goad. That's ridiculous, people. That is ridiculous. The Romans, the Pharisees, when the Christianity, when it it began to grow and the, the disciples began to go out and say, He is risen, He's alive. They wanted to squash it. They wanted to kill it. All they would have had to do is present the body. He's right here. He never rose from the grave. Well, maybe the, maybe the disciples. Yeah. If you were here this morning, you saw the play. One of the people thought in the drama, maybe the disciples took the body. Well, consider with me what the disciples went through. Peter, crucified upside down. Andrew, his brother, crucified upside down after being beaten for a full day. James, the brother of Jesus, sawn in half. Not this way. Exactly. (laughs) How about John? Boiled in oil, full on crispy creamed. Didn't kill him. So they banished him to a rocky prison colony on the island of Patmos. One of the few disciples actually not to die and died of old age. Talk about going through some trials. Man, fiery trials being boiled in oil. No, thank you. How about James? James had his head beat in with clubs till his brains came out. Thomas began to preach the gospel across Europe. Sorry, not Europe. Across India. And in India, he preached with such vehement passion that the people in India, and by the way, there is a church in India that still exists today that people trace all the way back to Thomas's ministry a lot of unbelievers didn't like Thomas's zeal and passion and conviction. So they took a spear and stuck him in the back and killed him. These guys, not only themselves, but many of their families, their wives, their children were martyred. They could not, they would not deny the reality. They had seen, they had handled, they had ate bread with Jesus. He is alive. I tell you the truth. If I was telling a lie... And somebody had my wife and was about to kill her. I was like, oh, guys, calm down. I was just joking, eh? And these guys said, hey, we cannot deny the reality that he is risen. We handled him. We touched him. We felt him. We hugged him. We ate food with him. He is risen. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you're thinking, okay, all right, I hear you. So what's the big deal about this resurrection? This morning, I want to tell you, do we actually have our picture of the empty tomb? The resurrection from the tomb is important. It is foundational to the Christian life. First Corinthians chapter 15, I want to read a verse to you. First Corinthians chapter 15 for you note takers. Verse 16 says this. For if the dead are not raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And then those who also have fallen asleep or died in Christ, they've perished. And if we have hope in Christ in this life only, now we of all men, we are of all men most to be pitied. If Jesus didn't rise from the grave, if the resurrection isn't a reality, we're wasting our time. We're just a big self-help group. And when you die, you perish. And those who have died in the past have perished. If the resurrection is not central to our faith, it's everything, guys. It is everything. I want to also present to you the resurrection sets every other religion apart. Every other religion says, here's what you do. They teach, but they do not give you the power to do it. Christianity, Jesus didn't say, okay, here's the truth. Follow it. He said, I am the truth. Follow me. Period. It's a pretty big claim. Everybody else, they made their teachings. They died and rotted. Jesus said, hey, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You've seen me. You've seen the Father. I'll prove it. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll rise it up again. The resurrection proves he is God. And it proves that now, because he is alive, we can have the power. Listen, Christians. Listen, people. We can have the power to live a holy life. A righteous life. Every other religion do these things, but they don't give you the power, the ability to do them. Christianity is different. Here's why. If you want to take a note, Colossians says this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. It says, Christ in who? And you, the hope of glory. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives, what guys? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. You see, every other religion says, do these things, here's the teachings, good luck, buddy. Christianity says, I'm the way and I will indwell you. I will fill you and I will give you the power to walk with God. And God, by the way, guys, if you've been coming to church for maybe 10, 20 years and you've been trying to do it on your own, your, your own willpower, your own ability to be holy, you can't do it. And maybe some of you here think, man, I'm a, I'm a pretty junk Christian because I'm always failing. I'm always falling. I have a hard time walking with God. The Bible says, Philippians chapter 6, verse 13, I can do all things what? Through. That's the key. Through Christ who strengthens me. It's Christ in us, living his life through us. That's the key of the resurrection. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you're saying, okay, Pastor Mike, I'm hearing you. I'm beginning to feel you a little bit. Uh, I got a question because I've been coming to churches. I've been seeing churches my whole life. And I've noticed one of the symbols of you Christians, it's not the empty tomb. If the resurrection is so huge, how come the empty tomb is not your guys' symbol? How come it's the cross? Why don't we have the tomb? That's what we stand for because that's how we live. The resurrected life living through us. How come it's the cross? How come the cross represents Christianity? Maybe we should start having tomb jewelry. Instead of little crosses for earrings, we'll wear little tombs. I mean, I would love to see a lady, you know, have a necklace Instead of a cross on her neck, she could have like a little stone that, you know, a little angel sitting on it, you know. <laughs> how, how come not? Why don't we do that? How about this? I was teasing Larson a little bit because, you know, he's, got, he's all got colors on him and stuff. And, and I got a cousin that has one big old bombucha cross. His whole back's one bombucha cross. Maybe we should get like tomb tattoos. It's the new rage. You know, Larson, get one on his belly and his 
belly button can be the door. That's my tomb tattoo. Check them out. Why do we do that? Why isn't the tomb our symbol? Why is it the cross? I want to present to you today that by the resurrected life, because of the empty tomb, we can have sanctification. We can live the Christian life. But before we can ever come to the tomb, before we can ever receive the resurrected life, we first must go, where guys? To the cross. We first must go to the cross. We first must receive cleansing and forgiveness for our sins. And then Christ can live through us. Amen? Does this begin to make sense? Yes? Before we can go to the cross, we must first go to the garden and understand. And I'm going to share with you three things that I want you guys to respond to. And as we consider the cross today, which will lead us to the tomb... I want you to consider and respond in three ways. Okay? You guys follow me? All right. We first go to the garden. Garden of Gethsemane, which literally means olive press, where they would take olives and smash them and crush them in order to get the olive oil to make light into their homes. And in this olive press garden, Jesus himself was crushed. And he prayed, if there's any other way to save humanity... Lord, let this, Father, let this cup pass from me. And then you guys know his most eloquent, beautiful, humble of all prayers. He said, Father, not my will be done, but thine will be done. And he prayed with such an intensity, such a crushing, a Gethsemane. The Bible says he sweat great drops of blood. And in this garden, one of his disciples, Judas, came with a Roman cohort, at least 600 men, and the Pharisees, and the scribes, and the temple guards, possibly a thousand people. Take this congregation, double it, possibly triple it. That's how many people came to arrest Jesus. This was a bombucha group of people with spears, and swords, and clubs, and torches. And they came to arrest the Lamb of God. They came to Jesus, they bound him, it says, and I was kind of chuck, you know, laughing with my, my youth group a couple weeks ago because we studied this, and think about this, they bound Jesus. Hello, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, God in a bod. He, this is God. He could have, this is the one who said, let there be light, galaxy, kaboom. I mean, his very word, talk about a big bang, let there be a galaxy, pong. You know, this is God. He could have been like, I would break your little rope. You know, and just like (laughs) thrashed him. Even in the tomb when Peter went to chop off uh, Malchus' axe to try to kill this guy, Malchus. uh, Jesus like, hey, put away your sword, man. Don't you know I could call my father and he could send 12 legions of angels. And if you don't know, that's a whole lot. By the way, in the Old Testament, God sent one angel at this one time in the Old Testament during this battle. And one angel whooped up and killed like over 100,000 people. So 12 legions of angels. Basically, Jesus said, I could call him God, the Father, and he would send enough angels to wipe out every single human being on the face of the earth. Hello. So was it those ropes that held him? No, you guys know. It wasn't those ropes that held him. It was his love for you. And they took Jesus and they took him to Caiaphas, the high priest. And they had this mock trial. Full on kangaroo court. Fully illegal proceedings. And they brought false witnesses against him. And they hit him and they smacked him. And they said, come on, who are you? Full on illegal trial. False witnesses. The Bible says in Isaiah... Isaiah 52, verse 14. His appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. How is that possible? Well, they took Jesus at this trial after they condemned him for blasphemy because he claimed to be the Son of God. And they covered his eyes. Well, actually, before they did this, they walked up to him and they said, Check him out. And they covered his eyes. And then they, boom, jacked them up. And if you've ever been in a fight, you know, when you see a fist coming at you, what do you do? You, you flinch. Even if you get hit, you still flinch a little bit. 
But when you can't see the punch is coming, you take the full force of that punch. And after they beat him bloody, they took off his rag and they said, okay, who hit you? Which fist was that that hit you? Prophesy, Jesus. Who hit you, Jesus? Prophesy. Now, he could have, again, at that point said, all right, enough of this. I finished already. Called down 12, you know, legions of angels. You know, Caiaphas, his pal, done. But he didn't. After they mocked him and spit on him and beat him, his face, so swollen, didn't even look human. So marred. It didn't even look human. So they take him to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate already had been in a lot of political trouble. He had already started a couple riots in Jerusalem. Once because he brought in some pictures of Julius Caesar and all the Jewish people were like, Oh, that's idolatry. And then another time he accidentally sort of took the money out of the temple to do some construction projects. And they rioted again. So he was already on thin ice. And he sees this mob coming to him and he's like, "Uh Uh-oh, trouble. And he didn't want to deliver the Lord unto death. So he figured when he found out Jesus was a Galilean, he said, you know what? I'm going to send him to Herod. So he sent Jesus to Herod, who happened to be in Jerusalem. And Herod, the tetrarch of Galilee, he was all stoked that Jesus was there. He's like, cool, the guy that does the tricks, the magician dude. Do some tricks. Make Do something. Make one rainbow. (laughs) The Bible says... Jesus never gave him the time of day. So they started to mock him, put a robe on him, going to slap him around, spit on him, hit him some more. After a while, Herod realized, oh, this guy is a waste of time, sends him back to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate comes out and says, hey, you know what? I, found, I find no fault in him. I want to release him. But there was a tradition at that time that during the Passover, they would release one man. And so he said, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to release one guy. Do you want me to release Jesus, you know, you guys' king? Or do you want me to release you this dude named Barabbas who is a murdering insurrectionist? This guy was a full-on murderer, caused riots. Who do you want me to release? This dude Barabbas, his name meant son of the father. Interesting correlation. You have Barabbas, son of the father, full-on sinner, and you have the true son of the father, the Savior. And the people said, Ah, oh, we want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Before you go, Oh, that Barabbas guy. I'm like, give him one crack. That was you and me. We are the sinful children of God. And we went free because Christ took our place. Amen? Then he took Jesus, delivered him under the Roman soldiers. They scourged him, the Bible says, with a flagellum. Without going into detail, big old whip, bunch of straps, ball bearings on the end, pieces of metal and bone inside of it. It was designed to shred a human. So you'd be whipped, it would pull, and your skin would come off. Usually if a man was whipped with a flagellum 39 times, he sometimes would actually die. Jesus was reduced to hamburger at this point. They put the Row back on him. Then they took a, a crown of thorns and put it on his head and took a, a reed and began to smash it into his head, smashing the thorns in there. They beat him up some more, grabbed his beard and pulled it out, spat in his face. And then it actually says they actually mocked him. For you youth guys, it means they teased him. Or maybe you've heard that old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's a lie. You ever been called stupid by somebody you love? You ever been called something bad by somebody you respected? Somebody you you cared about? Jesus cared about these Roman soldiers. He loved them. He loved them. And they teased him. They mocked him. He could have again at any time called down 12 legions of angels. Oh, I'm hamburger enough, Father. I can't take this anymore. But he didn't. Because his love for you, his love for me held him to that course. So he goes back to Pilate. And Pilate says, man, he's, he's reduced to hamburger. Maybe now they'll see that he's had enough punishment and they'll let him go. So he brings him before the Jews and they said, ah, away with them, crucify him. Get rid of him. We have no king. Caesar's our king. So he delivered Jesus to be crucified. The Bible says he carried his cross. 
But he gave his all and he fell under the weight. He gave every, being drained of blood, totally beaten, totally crushed, he fell under the weight of that cross. The Bible says that the Romans compelled a dude named Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross for him and they brought it to a place called Golgotha, known as the skull, because it's actually a literal rock and cropping that has holes in it, little pukas in it. It looks like a skull. And they plot him to this place called Golgotha. And there they crucified him with wooden nails. Sorry, not wooden nails, square nails. Not through the hands, lest it rip out through the wrists and through his feet. And if you know anything about crucifixion, the crucifixion itself did not kill a person. It was designed as an instrument of torture to cause suffocation. Because what would happen, the paralysis, the pain would enter a person's chest cavity and their diaphragm would kind of cramp up and it was real hard to breathe. And so what a man would have to do would squish down his chest cavity and push all the wind out of his lungs and stand up on the nails. Stand on the nails and open up his chest cavity and breathe. And I'm, a, I'm the wrestling coach here at the high school, and I'm a, I'm a scrapper. I'll tell you straight up. I like scrapping a little bit. Uh, and if I was on a crossbow, I'd be like, five days. You ain't going to kill me. I'd fight. I'd scrap. I'd try to hold on to life. Not Jesus. He was on that cross. Darkness covered the land. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. This is the hugest of everything he's gone through. The beatings, the whippings. This is nothing compared to what he went through on the cross. Because the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. He became our sin. And for the first time in all of eternity, the father and the son, they're one. The father and the son were separated by sin. Notice he says, my God, my God. Every other time you see Jesus pray, how does he pray? Father, Father, Abba. The relationship was broken. The first time in all of eternity, Jesus and the Father were separated by your and my sin. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he cried out famous last words, it is finished. And he gave up his ghost. He gave up his spirit. And the Roman soldiers at the time, they came because it was a holiday. It was Passover. We don't want to ruin the celebration with these dudes getting, being crucified on the road. They brought some clubs and they went to break the legs of the thieves next to him. Because what would happen if your legs were broken, you couldn't stand up on those broken legs and you would literally suffocate. So they broke the legs of the first two thieves next to him. And they came to Jesus. And you guys hopefully know the story. They came to Jesus and they were amazed. He's already dead. Whoa. This never happens. So they took a spear and jammed it into his side. Pulled it out. Out came blood and water. Number one, totally pictures, totally shows he was fully dead. He didn't swoon on the cross. He didn't fake it. He was totally dead. The blood and the plasma, the it, it separated. He was totally dead. But it also very possibly, it very possibly shows that Jesus on the cross, when he was giving up his spirit, his heart literally ruptured. And one of the signs if a, a man's heart ruptures that the pericardial cavity uh, can fill with a watery fluid. And very possibly if they stabbed him and pulled out that spear, that water shows that Jesus on the cross, yeah, he went through a beating. Yeah, he got scourged. Yeah, he was crucified, but he also suffered a broken heart. And I think about it. I want you guys to think about this morning. What would cause the heart of God to break? Very possibly, as he's on the cross, he's looking at the Roman soldiers. They're gambling. They're playing games for his clothes. And the bystanders, the people walking on the street, they're jeering at him. You saved others, save yourself. Come off the cross. We'll believe in you. Teasing, jeering at him. Ah, oh, his heart was broken because they're at the foot of salvation. Salvation is there. One of the thieves even gets saved. And they're playing games. This morning, are you breaking the heart of God? Are you playing games in life? 
and salvation is right there. This morning, are you breaking the heart of God? Because you're jeering, you're making jokes. Jesus Christ is just a F word to you. It's just a swear word to you. Are you jeering at Jesus? Oh, do something miraculous, then I'll believe. His heart is breaking for you this morning. It is breaking. There's so many people, guys. So many people. They're so close to a cross. So close to the cross, but yet so far from the Savior. They're so close to the wood, to the timber, but they're so far from the blood that can save them. If this morning, that's you, I want to let you know God loves you. His heart is breaking for you. He loves you a thousand percent. Amen? Guys, this morning, three things I want you to do. Number one, I want you to recognize. Recognize what Jesus has done for you. Recognize He loves you this much. God loves you so much, He became a man to die for you. And your sin problem, by the way, was so big, it took God with a cross to measure it. That's how big your sin issue is. It ain't a little thing. It's a big thing. And it took God Himself, Emmanuel, to pay for your sin. That's how much He loves you. Number one, I want you to recognize what He did for you and recognize I do need salvation. And number two, I want you to repent. To turn to God. Jesus started His ministry. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, He said, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. The apostle Peter started his ministry. Acts 2 verse 38. Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 3 verse 19 said, Repent therefore and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing, hello, refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, I know in America today, we're all about being politically correct. And personally, I would rather be biblically correct than politically correct any day. Amen? But in America, I know, we got to be politically correct so it's no longer the postman, but we say it's the postal carrier. We no longer say, I'm the chairperson of the board, or chairman of the board. You're now the chairperson. You see, we no longer say used cars, but it's previously owned vehicular devices. (laughs) You know, I'm not one short white guy. I'm pigmentally and vertically challenged. (laughs) We're so politically correct. We even try to be put, you know, PC about our sin. No longer is it adultery, but it's having an affair. You know, it's more sophisticated to say having an affair than adultery. It's no longer a lie, it's stretching the truth. It's no longer stealing, it's, oh, I borrow forever. Forget for tell you. <laughs> it's okay to laugh, you guys. We're so PC. And you know, it's Easter, I'll be nice. You want to be PC about repentance? Basically, guys, please let it go. Let it go. Let it go and turn to the Lord. What is that it? It's that sin. And right now I'm sure the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart about that, what that issue is, what that thing you just need to let go. I don't like let go. I don't want to let go. I don't think I need to let go. Hello? What's the middle letter in sin? I. If you can't surrender to God, if you can't let it go today, you are in sin and your sin is spiritual pride. 
You can't surrender to God and say, God, I repent. I turn to you. You are in spiritual pride. Hello, what's the middle letter in pride? Oh, you see the, the correlation. Middle letter in pride? I. Middle letter in sin? I. What are you doing? That selfish thing. That thing that you're doing that's satisfying your flesh. You're living for yourself. It's all about me. It's all about I. One of the things that uh, my pastor, Waxer, taught me is that, hey, you know, Mike, pride is kind of like bad breath. Everybody knows you get it except for you. (laughs) And the deal is, if you're here today and you got some spiritual pride and you just need to surrender, you got some sin, repent. Number one, again, recognize what he's done for you. Number two, repent. And lastly, lastly, rejoice. Rejoice. He loves you. Your sin has been paid. You can be forgiven. You can go to heaven. Man, he sees us right now, those who are washed in his blood, as righteous and holy before his eyes. Rejoice. Here this morning, you guys can do four things. Number one, you guys can... Hear that little message I shared to you about what the Lord did for you? And you can check them out. Gaze. Be one. Looky-loo. Uh, in Hawaii, you know what, what? What do you call the guys that they're driving their car? And they're, What's going on over there? You want what? Rubber necker. What's going on? And you guys know people who rubber neck, what happens to them? They crash and burn. And here this Sunday, you can come to church and go, oh, my friend brought me. I check him out. And you can rubberneck, check out this whole Jesus thing. But if you just rubberneck and you miss it, you're going to crash and burn. Or you can come here and you can grieve. And you can say, oh, so sad. Such a sad story to such a happy life. Such a bummer. Again, I want to say to you, you're, you're missing it. I'm going to trip some of you guys out. Isaiah 53 actually says, It pleased the Father to bruise the Son. Whoa. You mean the Father was stoked, pleased, happy to bruise the Son? Happy that Christ went to the cross? Yeah, it's not a sad story. If you're here today and you're grieving, Oh man, Pastor Mike gave us one big old harsh story. You're missing it. Because the Father was pleased. Jesus said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. You guys are the joy. The Father was pleased because we could be saved. You could be forgiven. Jesus was, man, he had a joy before him. That's why he endured the cross. He loves you. And those of you who are single, you know what it means to endure, waiting for that person that you want to be with. You know, oh, singleness, one trial, Bob. You endure the joy set before you. Or you can come here this morning and you can weep. Oh, man, I'm so unworthy. I just feel so bad. Again, you're missing it. God loves you. Or lastly, again, you can rejoice. You can come here this morning. You can recognize what he did. You can turn from your sin and rejoice. I am forgiven. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. God loves you guys. He loves you this much. And he didn't just say, but I love you. He showed it. He proved it. He proved that he loved you. This morning in closing, we're going to have communion. And as we do... Those of you who are saints, I want you to go forward for, with communion. Number one, recognizing what he did, receiving that bread, taking that juice, recognizing what he did for you. And as an act of repentance, have communion, turning from your sin. Amen? But also, as you confess your sin, also confess, you know what, Lord? I'm forgiven. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to acknowledge my sin to you, God, but I also know I am forgiven So recognize, repent, and rejoice. But if you're here today and you're not yet a saint, if you're not yet a Christian, I find it interesting that uh, every single Easter season, not only is it Easter, but it's also... (laughs) Tax time! 
Sorry, a little propaganda there. Don't look at the company. Um, it's also tax time. And you think about it, taxes, there's two things you can guarantee in life. Number one, death and taxes. And they're kind of similar. They actually are. You think about it, they're kind of similar. Because if your debt is paid, your taxes are paid, tax time, you're like, sweet, because I'm going to get a return. Vacation. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Tax time's like, dude, I'm, I'm looking forward to tax time because I got my reward coming. But, oh, you ain't been paying your taxes. Tax time's like, uh-oh, I got an audit coming. And I ain't looking forward to that. And you can go through life, and the Bible says it is appointed once for a man to die. One day, crazy kind statistic, 10 out of 10 people die. <laughs> you cannot beat that one. How about this one? One out of one. We're all going to die. We will all one day breathe our last. Every single heartbeat, we're drawn closer to that day. Next time. And if Jesus Christ is your Savior, man, I got a reward coming. I'm forgiven. My debt has been paid. But if Jesus isn't your Savior, you got to pay your debt. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, separation from God. Either you let Jesus pay it for you, you pay it yourself. The choice is yours. Christians. Non-believers, I want to see some hands. Raise your hand this morning if you recognize what Jesus did for you on the cross. Amen. Put your hands down. Again, I want to see some hands. Raise your hand this morning. Might be an attitude, might be an action, might be a lifestyle, an identity that you have. You need to turn from, you need to let it go. Let that sin go. Raise your hand up this morning. You want to turn and repent to the Lord. I know I do. I hope every single hand should be up, to be honest, because we could all use some more repentance in our life. And if you're like, well, I know, I don't need. I don't need to raise my hand. I'm good. The Bible says if you, ha- you say you have no sin, oh, you lie, you deceive yourself. Oh, I got you, huh? Read First John. If you say, I have no sin, you're a liar. The Bible says you're a liar. So every one of us, again, if you have some stuff in here today that you need to repent from, raise your hand. That a little better. All right. All right. Well, you guys think you can get by me. And lastly, recognize, yeah, that's me. Repent, that's me. But lastly, rejoice. Find it interesting. Hallelujah. Amen. If you guys ever get one chance next year to come to our Super Bowl party, whatever team Waxer roots for, I have to root for the opposite. <laughs> Gets a little friendly inter-church competition going. And I love going to our, 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 you know, our church Super Bowl party, and I watch people's expression. And like the past two Super Bowls have been pretty exciting. And uh, every time there is a touchdown, what happens? Yes! Ha! Touchdown. I'm rejoicing. Now, last year my team won, but this year, well, actually got lucky. Okay. Um, you rejoice. This morning I want to see some hands. If you have recognized what he did for you on the cross, if today you're here to do some business with the Lord and turn from your sin, and today you're like, you know what? I want to have some joy. I want to rejoice in what he has done for me. Raise your hand. Amen. Hmm. Okay. If today you're not yet a Christian, simple, recognize, repent, rejoice. Christians, go have communion. Recognize, repent. And what? You guys are smart. But if you're not a Christian... You think, you know what? Today I recognize. And today I want to turn to God and turn away from my sin. It has just robbed me so much of my life. And today I want to rejoice and be forgiven. I want to be stoked on God. We're going to go out here afterwards and the kids. Actually, I need everybody to kind of go out this back door when we're Powell. 
because all the kids were going to have one ginormous manga ding ding uh, bombucha. I don't even know. Anyways, we're having a big, huge Easter egg hunt. And all the kids are going to have fun and have Easter egg hunt, okay? But right after that, as a church, I want everybody to be there. Ten minutes, kids are going to go grab a bunch of eggs. So moms, you're going to be making like egg salads for weeks. You know, be awesome. Uh, after that, as a church, we're going to go over to the pool. And we're going to make another outward declaration of our inward faith. And we're going to baptize people. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A symbol that even as Christ, even as he was buried and he rose again through faith in him, my old life is buried in that pool. And now today I am born again because I believe, I recognize he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so today, if you have yet to be baptized, you don't got one big old class to go through. You don't got to put your name on a piece of paper and put on one robe or something. Get in the pool. Make that outward declaration of your inward faith in Him. Kind of like getting married. You get married. You get married. You put on an outward symbol of your covenant with the one you love. And baptism, it is an outward symbol, a covenant with the one who loves you and the one whom today I hope you learn to love. Amen? Okay. Uh, the worship team's going to come up. Worship. Christians have communion. Then we'll break. We'll have our Easter egg hunt. And then I'll call you guys over. And we'll have baptisms. Amen, guys. Let's go ahead and actually... Actually, let me pray for you guys. Lord, I thank you that right now you are touching hearts. You are changing lives. And Lord, every single one of us in this room... Lord, we all recognize, we all see the cross, what you did. And I ask, Lord, that as we have communion today, that you would wash us again, white as snow, by your pure, holy, just powerful blood. And Lord, as we have communion, as even, Lord, as we go in the waters of baptism, help us to obey as we turn and change our mind, change our life, change direction, as we repent, give us the power as we learn the resurrected life, Christ in us, that we can do all things through you, Christ, who strengthens us. And Lord, I pray today that every single one of us would get joy. And Lord, we would be joyful. And Lord, I pray that every single one of us, not just today, but every day, we would stay joyful. And Lord, I pray that we would begin to share the joy that is available in you. Bless these, your people, Lord. Minister to them, touch them. Lord, take whatever I said and Lord, anoint it with your Holy Spirit. Speak to them individually in their very soul right now. Touch their hearts. Touch their lives. While your heads are down, while your eyes are closed. If today you came and you're like, you know what? I, I wasn't yet a Christian. I'm not yet a Christian. But today, for the first time, I want to recognize and repent and begin to rejoice with Jesus. Raise your hand so I can pray for you and pray over you. Praise you, brother. Right on. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Amen, sister. I see you. In the back. Amen, brother. Right on. Church body, let's go ahead and lift our hands right now to God. Lord, we lift our hands right now to you recognizing that your hands are pierced for us. And Lord, these hands which have committed sin, these hands that have stolen and hated and all manner of deceit and vileness, Lord, we give these hands to you. And Lord, with these hands, we lift them in praise. Praise you, Jesus.